Uh, we start with a welcoming message from uh, our Dean and then uh, uh, another a short talk by our Director of Research. Um, and a big thank you to our, uh, uh, we call them our stakeholders, our chairs of the sessions and the, the discussants, uh, Dr. Nampundo Ramalekana, uh, Professor Irina van der Spey, uh, and uh, Dr. Leo Punzai will join us later. Our discussants, Dr. Tibelo Tabani, uh, Professor Rochelle Roos with us, and Dr. Associate Professor Kelly Malt will join us in the last session. So we are already five minutes uh, behind schedule. So this is wonderful, uh, colleagues. We'll have to uh, catch up at some point during the day. But let's uh, begin uh, uh, with the Dean's uh, welcoming address. Uh, over to you, Dean. Thank you very much, uh, Shepo, for putting together this uh, inaugural um, colloquium. Um, everybody has been talking about it for a long period of time, you know, uh, especially in the High Degrees Committee. Um, we realized that we needed more than just the initial workshop welcoming new students. Um, that workshop itself has been um, a wonderful thing that we did for the program, uh, but we always thought that we have to have uh, a follow up uh, during the year and nobody got to do it and you managed to do it um, uh, within a very short space of time. So this is fantastic. Um, uh, it is being piloted um, and it's likely that it's going to remain as the main feature, uh, additional feature of the PhD uh, program. Uh, so I'd like to thank you uh, for putting this together, uh, running with the idea um, um, and we are here. Um, it's uh, fascinating. It's, it's 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 hugely important for us. Uh, thanks to Gabby Ritchie also who gave you support, um, and Patricia um, as well. Um, colleagues, um, I really appreciate that you have set aside your time to participate in in this. Um, and and I would like also to thank the students who have um, uh, volu volunteered to. Uh, participate from next year it will be compulsory more or less but but this year it's it's great that students um uh, volunteered um uh, to do this um you know um, we are struggling with throughput we have managed to grow the phd program in fact uh, at a faster rate than we should uh, perhaps um uh, we have almost uh, 200 students every year um, we graduate now close to 20 um, um, a year, and that number always increases. Um, um, but the average has gone down. So from somewhere four to five, now it is five to six years. Uh, we really need to get it down to three to four years um, on average. Um, and then we'll have more uh, uh, students graduating with less uh, that we uh, bring in. So this is an important event because it complements the initial um, workshop. It helps to put students um, on on schedule um, to work towards a headline, a deadline and, 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 and then um, make progress on their PhDs. It will also help to um, um, gain new ideas or insights um, uh, from the discussion and also from the presentations themselves. I find that when I teach, every time I go to class, as I teach, ideas come, new insights come uh, as uh, I speak about what I'm teaching, um, even before students ask questions. Um, and, and at workshops as well and conferences, that's also what happens when one uh, prepares for um, a, a colloquium like this and presents, that process itself uh, brings to one's mind new insights that they had not thought about before. And we hope and I hope that this is what the student, the candidates here will experience um, that the writing process, the research writing process and the process of speaking about what they have been writing will in, on its own um, um, uh, provoke or bring to mind uh, new insights and ideas about what they are writing. This forum is not meant to replace um, supervisors, 
judgment uh, or direction it's to complement and 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 of course um, uh, the candidates have the final decision making power to accept any of the ideas that come up or suggestions um, and 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 choose the direction that they want it's not meant to uh, impose um, ideas on students uh, it's it's meant to help uh, the thinking with the thinking process so I'm very glad that uh, we have a colloquium taking place uh, it's a pilot but already uh, it seems to be um, um, a fantastic event that we should uh, um, uh, um, institutionalize within the faculty so uh, all the best to the presenters um, I hope you enjoy it, uh, but also receive um, um, useful feedback uh, from, from colleagues. Uh, thanks to the chairs um, for accepting to be part of this and uh, everybody participating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Professor Henry Mostert. Thank you, Chepu. I would like to encourage people to put on the um, on their videos, uh, I think also and keep them on for for the day because as we are speaking, it's much nicer to speak to a gallery of faces than speaking to yourself. Um, I, I hope I'm not I hope I'm not sabotaging your your protocol that you have established already, Chepu. Um, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm totally in support, Henry. Uh, I'm glad you said it, not me. I'm, I'm far too junior. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to be here at this inaugural colloquium. I hope, as like Dan would, uh, that it will be the first of many more. Chepu, you've asked me to speak about research in the faculty, but I'd like to put the spotlight on you, the one who had the idea of injecting some postgraduate culture into our faculty. I'm so grateful for this and I'm so inspired by you. Thank you in advance and well done. It's events such as these that hold the power of changing the way in which we do research in the faculty. And I think it's particularly profound that this change is coming from the cohort of PhDs they are the ones who are actively navigating change in their work. I've accompanied many students on their individual PhD journeys. I know that everyone starts this journey for a different reason. Some do it for professional enhancement, some do it to see the world, or to delay or escape from the demands of a professional career. Some want it because they love the life of the mind that academia is so famous for and some do it because of a deeply personal motivation maybe to honor someone or their deepest selves i've walked a part of the way with students with all kinds of reasons for why they want a phd degree every student's journey is different and yet the phd journey is like a pilgrimage at the end of it, you know you will be forever changed. It will make you see the world from a different perspective. And I'm not talking about the deep knowledge that you'll be acquiring on the narrow topic you'll be pursuing. That's already an advantage. But I'm talking next level personal stuff. I've seen it over and over again. The PhD gives you what you need to become the person you were always meant to be. It changes you and it is entirely self-directed. Sure, there'll be people you meet along the way, people who listen and comment, give advice. Sometimes they push back, criticize, but ultimately the decisions about the paths you take and the corners you turn are yours alone to make. At times the journey can be exhilarating, and at other times the obstacles may feel debilitating and often it might feel as though you're oscillating between moments of flight and periods of waiting. But let me share this little secret. Maybe three little secrets. Three definitive moments on your PhD journey. You can't force them. They'll arrive when the time is right, but it's worth being present for them. The one is the moment when the penny drops, when you realize um, 
when you really understand what your thesis is about. You can't tell when you when exactly that happens, but it's never any time before you're practically done writing the thesis. Typically, it's accompanied by, with the realization that you'll have to go rewrite some parts of it. The second is the moment that you realize you're on your own. Your supervisor, colleagues, friends, family, lovers, they walk a big part of the way with you, but they is a part of the journey that you'll be doing alone. You'll have surpassed the supervisor in your knowledge of the particular field and it will feel it's normal. It's supposed to be like that. You'll have headed into new territory and that is the point of the novelty and the originality that the degree requires. But the third moment is the best of all. I've seen it again not so long ago at the colloquium, much like this one, but it was an in-person colloquium. And every time I do, it gives me goosebumps. That colloquium was um, where South Africa's property law professors were listening to one another's graduate students present. Two students both of them pretty close to submission, started having this conversation during the Q&A about the law. It was deep, it was intense, and it was in a completely different universe from the rest of us. And I found myself wishing I could be one of them. Either it didn't matter, I just wanted to be right there where they were. And then I examined the faces of my colleagues around the room. Most of them, you must know, have already had illustrious careers, and yet their expressions told me that they were feeling exactly what I was feeling in that moment, listening to that those two PhD to be graduates. We all had depth envy. And that right there is the moment, the time in the process of writing your thesis that you are so deeply engrossed in your work and in the law as you will never be again. Perhaps not even if you do become a professor and get to make a living by indulging the life of the mind. All of us in the room recognized that moment, watching the two grad students go at each other. And I could tell we all missed it. We yearned for it. It's the kind of moment you hardly ever recognize when you're in it yourself, though. But it's moments like these that that make up the PhD journey. And it's in those moments that we change or recognize that we have changed. And it is that change that we carry with us into the world beyond the PhD. It's that kind of change that makes someone like Che who say, I want to do something to give back to the community that has helped me give myself this extraordinary gift. Because the PhD is a gift that you're giving yourself, and it is one that will keep on giving back to you and the people around you. It surely would have been nice for us to see each other in person, but this online world in which we live now has one advantage. Everything is recordable. I hope that you'll allow a recording to be made of your presentations. It would be an amazing memento, and someday further down the line, when this initiative of which you are a part today will have become a proud tradition and your time to submit your work for examination has come, you'll be able to look back on this presentation you've made today. You'll look at yourself and you'll say, my, my, how have I changed? Thank you, Chepo. Thank you. To, um Chris, Henry Mostad, uh, I appreciate it. So um, the the two speakers uh, seemingly have done this quite a lot. So they've kept to their time. So we have some uh, time left over to catch up, uh, which I can maybe use to run through maybe uh, some housekeeping. Uh, one of which uh, uh, Professor Henry Most has already mentioned. It would be nice uh, for everyone to uh, keep their cameras on. Um, as long as possible. Uh, it's not in person, but we are uh, trying to uh, not make everyone go through what our students or some of them uh, make us go through, which is to speak to 
uh, and, and uh, their initials in a circle. Um, and some some will say um, they are in a place where they can't talk, where where they in fact are. <laughs> um, so good that uh, cameras can be kept on. Second, that um, the three sessions will be chaired and run by the uh, three chairs. As I said, Dr. Nomfundo Ramalikana. Um, we will also have Professor uh, Orina van der Spey in the second session. And in the last session, the chair will be Dr. Leo Bunzai, who will uh, join us later. And um, perhaps the protocol we could um, observe would be uh, if your time is running out, maybe they will raise their hands or do something subtle so that you, you know, you're not disturbed in your presentation. Um, people from the first session will have 10 minutes each to present their, their work. And then after each 10 minutes presentation, uh, the, there will be time for feedback from the discussant and you will be given a short opportunity to, to respond if you if there's a question or you would like to respond. Uh, in the second and third sessions, um, uh, the opportunity to speak will be 20 minutes each. There will there again be an opportunity to respond. And I hope the chairs will run a, a roughly a tight shift uh, so that we remain on schedule. Um, there is a, a, a small prize uh, uh, thanks to uh, a generous uh, sponsorship from LexisNexis. Uh, they've also committed that they would like to sponsor it every year for the <laughs> foreseeable future. So uh, maybe we can build on and do something more uh, next year. Um, yeah, this year we've got a start. So uh, I know not everybody's sort of competitive or whatever, but maybe it's an incentive, um, maybe something to put on your CV that you were the best speaker at a, a, a in old colloquium. I also want to acknowledge our colleagues, uh, Professor Debbie uh, Collier has also taken the time to join us. Uh, Professor uh, Philippe Salazar is also um, here with us, and, and uh, our also colleague, uh, Ms. Patricia Phillips, um, who we, most of you would have all met. So um, with that, uh, Gabby, I hope I'm not missing anything with the, with the housekeeping, um, and I hope everyone is clear on uh, what we need to do. Uh, I should also just add one last thing that uh, we are trying to do this as a largely student-oriented developmental project um, to get the uh, research life of, of the faculty and for students uh, going, students to get active. We still are concerned that uh, the number of participants were relatively low this year, so uh, we will try and record some of the sessions and make something of an advert so that we have higher numbers next year. Uh, and it is, it is some work for us to put together logistics and asking everyone to pitch in, but we think you know, it is worth it and it, hopefully you guys find it useful. Um, as I said to you before, I, I certainly found it useful as a doctoral student. And uh, it, it, it helped me finish in a much shorter time than I would have otherwise. Um, uh, we also have something to look forward to. Um, our keynote address from Professor Hugh Corder, Emeritus Professor Hugh Corder, who has uh, generally, generously uh, agreed to say something moving and inspiring to all of you. Uh, he, he served in the faculty for over 48 years, I think. So he knows a lot about a lot of things. <laughs> um, okay, so I what we can maybe do is um, stop there. And we there is no breakout rooms for so we'll all stay in the same session. Um, we will start the next session at nine. And um, we have three presentations there. 
Uh, if anyone would like to look at the abstracts um, that were submitted, uh, let me know and I'll circulate them. But uh, the presentations uh, are from three LLM students. And I hope we haven't made any errors with, we did make one error initially where we thought a student's abstract fell in commercial law, but uh, the student said they, they're in public law. So uh, we hope we haven't made any of those kinds of errors uh, in, in uh, but in our defense, it, it, you know, it, we, we were, we're not experts in the area and we, we weren't quite sure. But um, uh, we also have the discussions for the first session, uh, Dr. Tibelo uh, Tabadi, who, who I've, I've, I've served with uh, elsewhere in a, a, a faculty committee, but I'm now meeting for the first time, uh, and he's generously agreed to, to help us with this. Um, so we hope you find the comments uh, useful, and most importantly, we hope that uh, participating in this every year helps you make yourself accountable, because we will also keep track of what you presented this year. So you can't present the same thing next year. That would presumably mean you haven't done nothing, you haven't done anything in, in a year. So hopefully next year, uh, there is work and you've done something new and we'll hear something new from you. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there um, four minutes till the next session and uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Numfundu Ramalikan, who I am very grateful to, who's agreed to help with this, uh, uh, even though we are both teaching at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, and then uh, Numfundo, I, I don't know if you want to uh, wait a few minutes and then start at nine, or do you also want to run through some some things? I just wanted to say good morning. I have nothing to say except for the fact that I think there is a little bit of unfair discrimination against the LLM students. Right. Why are they only given 10 minutes? But that's a little joke, and I hope you can laugh. Simon, you see what I'm doing there, but not really. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 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 I have no defense. Uh, mea culpa. Uh, uh, ten minutes because uh, I, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, I should also say uh, in correspondence, it's only PhD students who will write in their signature PhD student. <laughs> so uh, maybe PhD students, you know, want the recognition. Uh, but we will review and revise uh, next year. Um, uh, we have two, two, two observations about the time so far, and we, we are taking notes, and we will, <laughs> we, will, we will do better next year. Okay, I'll stop there, and then um, uh, we can then start in two minutes. And uh, yeah, all the best. Hope you have a good session, and... Yeah, I hope uh, uh, 10 minutes is not too short. Uh, uh, Simon, Joy, and Rovimbo. <laughs> Sorry, I should also ask, uh, are they, is everyone clear, okay, uh, no um, questions from anybody? Okay, everyone's good. Uh, and I see uh, Joy, Joy's already uh, uh, gone to the mattresses with us. Uh, it's a, yeah. it's a, <laughs> um, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm not sure why, but it seems I can't share my screen and also be on video at the same time. I don't know if this is usually the case, but 
um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, yeah, I'll just, after um, presenting, I'll just uh, kill the screen sharing and then hopefully that will put the video back on. Okay, um, so on the time constraints, I agree with you, Nomfundo. We need time. <laughs> There's a great chance that I won't even be able to explain what I have to explain. So I think in case that happens, I think it's a good idea for me to just read out my abstract. Hopefully that will give you all an idea of you know the background and what I'm hoping to achieve. So you can judge at the end whether or not I succeeded. Although with the time constraints, very concerned. Okay, um, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. I'll just read it out quickly. Um, okay, so with the current global pandemic, force mayor has become an instrumental contractual provision. Over the last year, an increasing number of parties have invoked this legal provision to avoid performance without suffering the typical consequences of breach of contract. Force mayor is a concept in terms of which parties can be excused from performing their contractual obligations if they can demonstrate that an unforeseeable, irresistible event has taken place and has rendered performance impossible. Now, while there is a body of work on force mayor in South Africa, there is not much literature on strikes as force mayor events. In this paper, I intend to explore whether strikes should be categorized as force mayor events in South Africa, taking into account the South African risk profile. I answer this question by conducting a critical analysis of the law relating to force mayor and strikes, as well as an examination of risk management in the South African context. So that is just high level what I am hoping to achieve. I'm just going to now share my presentation. It's just pointers. Um, okay. Joy, are you still with us? Joy? I would say skip the slides and, and just speak. Yeah. Joy? Maybe we should wait another minute to see if we can connect again with Joy. And if not, perhaps we can ask um, She can just speak then. Um, hi, everyone. I'm sorry. Um, I'm back. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. I lost two minutes. <laughs> okay, I will just share my screen once again. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation. It's very brief. Please let me know when you can see my screen. Yes. yes, we see it. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is my my topic. It's law and context around strikes as force major events, and it's tended to be an analysis with a view to developing a balanced risk sensitive commercial clause. And I think I included this part primarily because I have some experience in practice. So I want this to be very, very practical. And I think it's one of my struggles is you know, theoretical discussions because I, you know, have more practice experience than 
I'm theory, but this is my this is my my heading. And the question that I'm looking to answer is whether strikes should be categorized as force majeure events in commercial agreements in South Africa, taking into account the South African risk profile, right? So the key sort of concepts that will be interacting throughout this paper is strikes, force majeure, and the South African risk profile, right? Um, and then I'm going to answer this question by first doing an analysis of you know, the law surrounding force majeure, um, so basically a discussion around that. I'll then uh, discuss. I'll then um, discuss strikes, and sorry. I'll then I also I'm also working. So if you hear other notifications, sorry about that. Um, I'll also discuss uh, you know the right the exercise of the right to strike in South Africa, and lastly I will look at the principles governing risk management in South Africa. Right. And now just to get give a little bit more detail um, into force mayor, I will start by discussing possibility of performance. This is the contractual element from which force mayor emanates. So I will discuss uh, possibility of performance, discuss initial impossibility and supervening impossibility. And then I'll um, look at supervening impossibility um, in depth because it's more relevant to force mayor than um, initial impossibilities. And unfortunately, due to time, I can't, I can't get into the reasons, but I'll discuss supervening impossibility and force mayor. And then I'll look at force mayor now um, and the elements of force mayor, which are unforeseeability, inevitability, and you know, taking reasonable steps. Having done that, I'll then look into strike action. And under this, I will just have a general discussion of you know, the laws governing strike action, I will look at the international recognition, make reference to some of the conventions and, you know, the constitution, which basically recognizes um, um, these conventions. I'll look at the requirements in terms of the Labor Relations Act, as well as the consequences of a protected as well as an unprotected um, strike. So briefly, that'll be my discussion. And then lastly, I'll talk about risk management. And this is the chapter that I'm currently working on. And it's a bit different because it's not law, it's more corporate governance. But yeah, basically, the purpose of this chapter is to legitimize my paper because I'm looking at whether or not strikes should be categorized as um, force major events. And, you know, my finding is that not all of them should be. But I use um, risk management to demonstrate that, you know, strikes have been. Um, identified in South Africa as a very imminent event. Imminent and um, it's imminent and it's very likely. So if something is likely, it, now it doesn't meet the test for force mayor, which means you can't really say all strikes are force mayor because a, an aspect of that is, you know, unforeseeability. But if, you know, multiple, so I'll speak about IMSA, this is the Institute of Risk Management in South Africa. This is one organization that has compiled annual reports over the years, as well as the Department of Labor. And these reports show a general increase in strike action. So the argument that I'm trying to make is that if we can show that strikes are something that is happening, something that's come to be expected in South Africa, it can't, it can't meet the force major test, of which um, unforeseeability is, you know, is a very critical aspect um, of. So yeah, so that's basically the purpose of this um, chapter is to just legitimize this paper and say, you know, there's actual proof that strikes are very common in South Africa. And here's the proof, here are the reports from the industrial action, uh, from the, sorry, Department of Labor, and they've shown this, this increase. So I'm trying to, um, yeah, just like substantiate why I don't think all strikes should be um, force mayor. And then having looked at IMSA reports and DOL reports, I will then delve into the ISO, which is a beast I just, I'm struggling with, but it's basically um, one of the primary guidance documents. It's, a, it's an international standard and it sets out um, ways to sort of manage risk in South Africa, well, generally in the world. And it also um, speaks to different strategies which companies and parties could take to manage or mitigate um, risks. So I'll try to apply ISO to strikes as a risk event in an effort to show that if a party, so this will go towards um, showing what could constitute reasonable steps 
for purposes of the force majeure test. But yeah, I feel like I'm running out of time. So I'll just go to the yes, last slide. Are. I'm just, okay. Uh, so the last thing is my findings, which are basically, so in the end, I find that strikes should not, should not be categorized as force majeure events as the default position. So not all, every strike should just be categorized as, um, as force major events. Only when a party can demonstrate that a strike in question was unforeseeable and inevitable, and that they've taken reasonable steps to limit further damage, should they be um, allowed to use force major to get out of you know, their, their obligations in terms of a contract. And then if in the event of a protected strike, I'll try to argue that only when a party can demonstrate that the strike was foreseeable because we, in the case of a protected strike, then you know there's a process that has to be followed. So a party can foresee it, but that they could not prevent it, even though they could foresee it. And then I'll yeah. Th thank you so much, Joy, for that presentation. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry yeah. about the time. Yeah. Um, I kindly ask uh, that Dr. Tavelo Tavani uh, come in uh, to just send some comments on your presentation and the abstract. Uh, thank you very much, Lumfundo, and thank you to Joy. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can hear me well. Um, great. All right. Um, I think it would have been useful to, to have uh, had sight of your full presentation, Joy. Um, I see your slides are answering some of the questions that I had. Um, so, so that will um, sort of limit my, my comments. Uh, but let me congratulate you for putting yourself out there to test your ideas and also to congratulate you on uh, finding a topic that is quite interesting and a topic that speaks to what is happening in the South African uh, labor market. Now, um, what I was struggling with um, was the context, particularly where you, um, you link what is happening to the pandemic. Um, the increase of, um, you know, of uh, strikes and the use of the force majeure um, losses. Um, I thought the pandemic were, had actually slowed down, um, uh, you know, strikes and so forth. So what I would advise there is that perhaps your background and your context must speak directly to the, 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 the issue. Um, you know, background can be as wide as you want, can be as broad as you like, uh, but it must always be linked to, to the question itself or the topic itself. Um, so that, that is one. I found a, a bit of a disconnection with the pandemic and the strikes because uh, for me, I mean, as uh, somebody who is trying to follow uh, what is happening in the, in the in, in public, I mean, in the um what is happening around i seem to not see strikes happening happening that much now the other important thing that i see um is that you identify that there's a body of work in this area it would be interesting to highlight at least um, one or two um, um positions that have been taken on this because remember you are joining uh, an ongoing discourse. Um, certainly, you are coming in into something that is already there. Um, so, at least find, I mean, put across what uh, the major works or the major positions um, are on this on this topic. But it is important that you have identified it, which is which is always uh, good for for an LLM dissertation. Now, the categorization of, um, of, of, of events in South Africa as force major, I found that your research question is in two parts, right? The first part is whether strikes should be categorized as force major events in South Africa. That part I found uh, crisp and clear. Now, the latter part where you want to ask whether this is the position taking into account the South African risk profile. Uh, I struggled a bit with that latter part, uh, particularly because I thought the research question um, is a legal problem, right? Is a legal issue. Um, now, the latter part of your question that links this with the risk profile of South Africa, I struggled a bit with that. 
Um, and I think you highlighted, you know, presentation that uh, uh, the risk chapter uh, is a chapter that is difficult to tackle because uh, it brings uh, corporate governance issues um, and other risk uh, management issues into into play. And sorry how to cut you off there. We, we have five minutes for the response. I'm so sorry. Am I out of five minutes already? Yes, and uh, Joy needs a little bit of like a minute to respond. Joy, you have about a minute and a half. I'm so sorry to respond. No, actually, I was happy to listen to all of the comments. I don't really have any response, so please do continue. OK, maybe then let me just. Uh, um, yeah, I think I have said pretty much what I wanted to say. Except maybe one last point is that um, uh, you want to develop the common law or you want a force mayor to be interpreted differently, uh, perhaps to be widened there. Now, what I wanted to find out is whether there is any comparative jurisdictions, anything uh, beyond South Africa where this has been done, which you can look into. Um, so that is the last point that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taban. Uh, uh, the next speaker uh, is um, Ravimba. Remember, if you can start. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I don't know if you can see my, my slides then. We can see your slides and we can hear you really well. Okay, thank you. So my name is Rimbo Anam Shahiri. I'm a first year master's student who is specializing in private law. I'll be presenting a topic that is at a proposal stage. So my research topic is uh, surrogacy in South Africa. Is there a need to amend laws? Um, on remunerated surrogacy. So, so the issue of surrogacy is gaining prominence. This is because, like, uh, the rise in infertility, like the rise of infertility in South Africa and globally, the availability of um, the new technological innovations and improvements, even the shortage of children for adoption, and also the desire. Uh, to have a, uh, a child who is genetically related to oneself is, is triggering most infertile couples to resort to, to surrogacy. So in uh, answering what surrogacy is, surrogacy is an, like an agreement between a woman who carries a child. So that, child, that woman is the surrogate mother. Uh, so it's the agreement between the surrogate mother and the intended parents um, of the child to be born by the surrogate mother, in which the surrogate mother agrees to bearing a child for the intended parents and deliver the child upon birth. So surrogacy is categorized into two classes. There is commercial or remunerated surrogacy and also altruistic surrogacy. So just to define and to give you like a brief um, overview of what commercial surrogacy and altruistic surrogacy is. So commercial surrogacy occurs when the surrogate mother receives monetary payment for a pregnancy beyond the payment of medical and other reasonable expenses. So altruistic surrogacy arises when the surrogate mother agrees to bear a child for the commissioning parents for free and she does not receive any financial reward for the surrogate uh, agreement. Uh, that is beyond reimbursement of uh, for her medical cover and pregnancy related expenses. So currently uh, the legal framework of South Africa caters for altruistic surrogacy only and prohibits commercial surrogacy. So now one of the, um, of the pertinent gaps relates to remuneration of the surrogate mother. The main purpose of the research is to determine whether um, there is any need 
to amend current laws on surrogacy in South Africa to include remuneration for the work rendered by the surrogate mother through the pregnancy and the childbirth. So from this understanding, this area remains relevant and needs empirical attention. Uh, the study will seek uh, to answer the following questions. Why is remunerated surrogacy illegal? Is the ban on remunerated surrogacy unconstitutional? And what are the dangers of permitting remunerated surrogacy? How can remunerated surrogacy be regulated in order to avoid, sorry, in order to avoid those dangers? And uh, to what extent do the decisions and laws on remunerated surrogacy in other jurisdictions able to provide a model for the South African legal system? So, um, okay, moving on to the methodology. So I will not uh, do much on on this one because uh, I've already uh, it's already shown on the on the slides. So the thesis will just adopt a desktop research methodology, and um, it will also rely on primary sources and uh, secondary sources. So. Notwithstanding the potential gains that may be made by amending the laws on remunerated surrogacy, some scholars have expressed their objections and concerns about such changes. So, for example, Elizabeth Anderson have argued that remunerated surrogacy gives rise to challenging legal, cultural, ethical, moral issues, including exploitation, uh, degradation, dehumanization, marketing of surrogate mothers, and most importantly, the exploitation and sale of children. So, on the other side, again, um, some scholars support the notion that there is a need to amend laws on surrogacy to include remunerated surrogacy. So, this can be argued that remunerated surrogacy um, does not necessarily amount to the sale of children or the exploitation of children because the payment at the surrogate mother is not for the transfer of the child and the rights from the surrogate mother to the commissioning parents, but actually it's rather for, for the services rendered by, um, by the surrogate mother and for the pain and suffering endured during their pregnancy and the childbirth. So let's say in terms of uh, the issue of um, exploitation, since um, it's according to to Karl Marx's theory of exploitation, exploitation is referred to like an act of just treating someone unfairly to, to derive a profit from their labors. However, so we can't say that um, surrogate mothers are being exploited because um, it can be argued that permitting remunerated surrogates may may actually amount to a mutually advantageous uh, um, arrangement if the surrogate mother receives adequate remuneration for the services she rendered. So this would uh, counter the issue of unfairness between the surrogate mother and the commissioning parents since both would benefit. So in a scenario that uh, the commissioning parents will be receiving a, a child and then the surrogate mother who will be adequately remunerated for the services she, she rendered. So from this perspective, banning remunerated surrogates will actually um, amount to, exploit to exploitation because the commissioning parents will gain from the uh, transaction while least the surrogate mother gains nothing for the services she rendered. So uh, continuing from from the previous slide. So the liberal uh, feminists view or remunerated surrogacy as a new forum for women to exercise their rights to enter into contracts, just like men who enter into contract to donate sperm. So many professional people, such as teachers, doctors, nurses, love their job and care about the people they deal with in their professional lives. But uh, they are still providing uh, their services for, for money because it is their job and they're expected to be paid. Also, like the Constitution provides that everybody um, has got a right to freely choose their trade, occupation or, and, uh, and profession. So this implies that surrogate mothers have the right to, to enter their uh, into their specific occupation 
and also be remunerated for for it and also remunerated surrogacy may not be cannot be banned on the grounds of um degradation or dehumanization of a surrogate mother because she has a uh, she has um rights over her womb and may decide what she wants to do with it and um also provided that she is not coerced so consequently uh, remunerated surrogates may not be dismissed also um, on the basis that it's, it's unethical or immoral, as the same narrative will also apply to altruistic surrogacy. So, um, uh, uh, also banning remunerated surrogacy might, um, might lead to the creation of black market and illegal agreements, and this would actually lead to exploitation, other than in a scenario where um, uh, they they properly regulate the laws and then allow remunerated surrogacy. Thank so, you so much, Joy. Um, you unfortunately have run out of time, but this is a really nice and compelling presentation. Oh, so <laughs> sorry. I kindly asked uh, for Dr. Davani to come in. Thank you. Um, um, is it Joy who is uh, presenting now? No, no, not Joy. Um, Anna. All right. Thanks, Anna. Um, the topic is equally very um, interesting. Um, I looked at your title and I thought uh, perhaps you should focus it really around remunerate, uh, remunerated uh, surrogates in South Africa. Um, let it be very clear. Um, let it be uh, succinct. Um, you, you can find a way of uh, reframing it, uh, but it, it has to be focused somehow. Um, as I looked at your, your abstract, I couldn't quite get um, a clear problem statement. Um, it's something that you might want to refine uh, because a clear problem statement will lead to a clear legal problem right, a clear research question. So you, you might want to go back and, um, and, and, um, and clarify your, your problem. Now, that leads me to your research question, right, or questions. I see you have, uh, you want to tackle five questions, right? Um, and this is a master's dissertation, um, you know, you will discuss this with your supervisor, but uh, in my experience, um, for a master's dissertation to take so many questions, um, you might be limited by, you know, by space, you might be limited by the time that you need to complete the work. So perhaps find one or two questions that are quite clear. Um, even if you can find one major question and ancillary questions, right? So don't take too much. Uh, you will end up not going deep enough in your analysis, right? And some of the questions, I thought they are not really research questions. They are not really uh, legal problems. For instance, you want to establish whether there is a need for, to amend the laws as a question. And I thought that could easily be answered at the end of the paper, right? Your dissertation at the end will reveal whether there's a need to amend the laws or not. Uh, so it might not be a legal problem um, on its own. So. Yeah, in a nutshell, try to narrow down your questions, see if you can match some of them and uh, don't take too much on that. Um, on comparative jurisdictions, I see you have identified five. Again, those might be too much. Uh, you need to go deep enough. Um, so try to perhaps limit and justify, right? You need to justify why you choose certain uh, jurisdictions over the others. Lastly, I see that you have a theoretical lens. Uh, you're going to use liberal feminist theory, which is always important because it focuses your um, your your discussion. All right, um, I, am I not out of time, Numpundo? Luckily not. So uh, remember, if you want to take a minute to maybe respond, only a minute. Okay. Great. Thank you, Doctor. I know doctor. it's okay. You can proceed. Okay, does Dr. Tavana have any more um, comments and suggestions on the paper? There's one minute. Okay, 
Um, that said, we, we are fortunate that um, Simon will have an extra minute. So Simon, um, come in with your presentation. Thank you. Cool, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Uh, let me know if that is showing. Yes, we can see it. Is it full screen or is it still a bit weird? Not, not full screen yet. Okay, I think I need to go to the actual PowerPoint. Now is it full screen? Yes. Okay, yeah, cool. Can you start my time now? <laughs> All right, so yeah, my name is Simon. Um, I'm doing my master's in the private law department, uh, more specifically the law of delict, the law of defamation. Um, and the question that sort of grasps my attention is this, uh, at what point does a joke become a legal wrong justifying resort to defamation law? So it ought to be quite clear already that this question couples what most would consider to be two diametrically opposed facets of life. Uh, namely humor and the law. So on the one hand, humor is quite a fascinating area of study. It's rich with psychology, philosophy, and sociology, um, and a whole lot of laughter, which is great. Um, and then on the other hand, we have the law, which is quite bland, dry, um, and is often shaft as being reserved for the soulless amongst us. So I'm quite interested to see uh, what the law does when it is confronted with humor. Um, and more particularly how it might go about fitting this um, round peg of humor into the square hole of defamation. So defamation law essentially seeks to strike this balance between two competing constitutionally protected rights. So on the one hand, we have the right to freedom of expression uh, in section 16 of the constitution. And on the other hand, we have this uh, protection of reputation. Reputation is not explicitly protected by the Constitution, um, but it is derived vis a vis the right to dignity, which is contained in Section 10. So the balance that you need to keep in mind is between the right of a jokester uh, to tell jokes unabated or free of, uh, of legal constraint, um, but also the right of the everyday person to not be unduly defamed um, by jokes. Um, so a defamatory act can be defined as the wrongful and intentional publication of a defamatory statement concerning the plaintiff. Um, and this can essentially be reordered into these elements of liability. Uh, we have publication, reference, and the defamatory statement. And once that has been established by the plaintiff, a presumption arises that the publication was both wrongful and intentional. And so it's important to bear in mind that the plaintiff bears the onus to establish the first three. Um, and once those have been established, the defendant may raise certain defenses or justifications to rebut these two presumptions. Um, these are some of the recognized defenses. I'm going to skip to the last. Under intention, mistake, provocation, and jest are the typically recognized defenses available to the defendant. And I'm very much interested in this defense of jest down at the bottom here. So unfortunately, there's a lot of historical confusion um, as to the precise location of jest as a defense to defamation. And there's a lot of back and forth as to whether it actually sits neatly um, as a justification um, under intention or whether it should actually come in a little bit earlier under the defamatoriness inquiry. Um, and there are a whole host of early cases and early um, academic writers um, who, have, who have grappled with this issue. So I've had to look elsewhere um, to other legal jurisdictions and the resounding consensus seems to be that jest or humor actually serves to influence the defamatoriness um, of, a, of a statement. And so it comes in much earlier um, in the defamation suit. It's not actually a defense to be raised once the prima facie case has been made out, it actually needs to be considered earlier in the inquiry as to whether the publication is defamatory. Um, and there are a whole host of cases from, from several jurisdictions confirming this. So in South Africa, I suppose the, the piece de resistance of um, jest as it currently stands is the case of LaRue versus Day, which I will get into soon. Um, 
And this little paragraph here confirms that where it says that the concept of a joke may also come in at the earlier stage of determining whether a statement is defamatory. Um, so that obviously means that the test for defamatoriness is very important um, in this regard. Um, there are some you know, previous conceptions of it, the shun and avoid test, uh, whether it exposes the plaintiff to contempt or ridicule, but the standard test or the accepted definition of defamatoriness now comes from an English case called Sim versus Stretch, uh, which is that the publication essentially needs to, to lower the plaintiff in the estimation of right thinking members of society generally. Some important qualifications to make on this test is that there is a presumption of damage, so you don't actually need to prove that your reputation was actually harmed or that there was an actual lowering. Um, it's sort of presumed that a defamatory statement did already do that. Um, it's an objective test, meaning that you cannot lead evidence as to how people actually received the statement and what they actually thought of you. Um, it all turns on this objective, reasonable person um, or right thinking member of society generally. Um, another qualification is that person doesn't have to be a South African as a, on the whole. It can be limited to a particular segment of society. Um, and the person who gets to decide whether the, the statement is defamatory um, is obviously not the plaintiff or the defendant, it's the judge. Um, we don't have a jury system in South Africa for better or worse. And so this uh, element of liability falls to be determined by the judge, which is quite important to bear in mind. Cool, so that's defamation law in a nutshell. Um, and then the second part of my dissertation needs to look at humor. Um, and humor is really interesting to research, but unfortunately, the more you read of something, the more boring it gets. And so there's a great quote by E.B. Weicher saying that humor can be dissected as a frog can, but the thing dies in the process and the innards are discouraging to any but the pure scientific mind, which is kind of what I'm finding as I'm doing the dissertation. Um, there are essentially three big theories of humor, which seek to explain why we might find certain things funny. So they are the superiority release and incongruity theories. The superiority theory essentially says that when you disparage others, um, you feel better about yourself. And that is why we find things funny. So some examples include uh, like schadenfreude, so laughing at someone tripping or something like that. Uh, release theory uh, involves the release of um, repressed sources of anxiety. So when we're younger, that usually revolves around potty humor. And then as we go through puberty, it suddenly becomes overtly sexual humor, um, essentially saying that we find things funny because they deal with these taboo topics that we're unwilling to speak about. And then lastly, incongruity theory deals with the juxtaposition of two phenomena next to one another and the absurdity kind of um, creates the humor uh, as we resolve sort of cognitive dissonance in the image. Um, these theories are not mutually exclusive, so a joke can be explained using all three or just one, and they are not equally present. So one joke might rely solely on superiority theory um, or in the majority, and it might contain uh, tra uh, remnants of release or incongruity theory. Um, Laura Little in America has analyzed some of the case law and has found that superiority theory is the one that is most likely to attract liability and defamation cases, and incongruity theory is the least likely to attract liability. So the case in point that I'm going to be looking at is the case of the Rue versus Day. High level overview of the facts, uh, three high school learners uh, created a photoshopped image of their principal and vice principal engaged in some sexually promiscuous act. Um, they took a picture of the internet and pasted the principal's faces over the image and then stuck it up around the school um, and the vice principal sued them for defamation. Um, the defendants argued that they were just joking and so it's interesting to analyze how the judges dealt with the humor behind the publication. Um, interestingly, the Constitutional Court split 6-4, um, so it was quite a narrow divide um, in determining the defamatoriness of the image. The, they both um, accepted that release theory was involved because it obviously involved um, sex. 
Um, but the majority felt that the humor behind the image rested on superiority theory. And I've just highlighted some of the words like tarnish, reduce, belittle, contempt, disrespect, and ridicule uh, that evidence this. Whereas the minority felt that incongruity was to blame uh, for the humor. And um, so they speak about it was a crude pastiche, misaligned, wrongly sized, different in size, cut and paste job. And that's why it was funny. And so in conclusion, it seems as if judges are less forgiving of superiority humor and more accepting of incongruity humor. And this has implications for litigants because it means that they actually have to engage with humor theory when dealing with chest and defamation. It raises interesting questions about whether we should have judges deciding these questions or a jury. And lastly, it means that comedians have to think twice before they make defamatory jokes. Thank, Thank you so much. That was perfect. <laughs> um, I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Taban. Thank you. Um, all right. So, um, Simon, um, equally a very interesting topic. Um, certainly there's a lot of humor going around uh, in the political cycle. Um, you see that uh, uh, it will actually be very much so uh, given the, the period we are in, which is the election period. So this is quite interesting. Now, I found the topic or the title very well focused. Um, it, it's stated in a, in, a, in a different way, in a question form, uh, which is also quite uh, catchy. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm happy with that. The background and the context is also well articulated, um, which always leads nicely to your research question. Um, like I, I said to the previous uh, presenters, if the problem statement or the context is well articulated, it will help you lead, I mean, it will help you get into um, um, uh, formulate your research question uh, very clear. Um, but talking about your, your research question, um, I wanted to find out how you, how you reconcile and link it to the question that is the title, right? Uh, because in the research question, you seek to evaluate the defense of jest, right? But in the title, uh, you want to establish when a joke becomes a legal wrong, right? So I just wanted to find out how you reconcile and link those two. Are you conducting a critical evaluation of the defense of jest against a defamatory joke? Um, so, so maybe just clarify where, where, where you want to position this. Um, I found that you have explored some theories, which is always important. Um, I mean, this is a scholarly. This is a scholarly piece. It is. I've always been advised that uh, for scholarly writing, especially for a thesis or a dissertation, you have to ground it in some theory, right? Um, so you have explored theories. It would be interesting to see uh, which theory you are leaning to. Um, uh, and 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 yes. Um, I don't know. Let me just finally check my notes if there's anything else that I've uh, noted here. Uh, but it doesn't look like there's anything else. Uh, so I'll hand over to Nomfundo. I, I think there's still two minutes to open to Simon and other, other colleagues. Yeah, Simon, if you want to respond to any of those suggestions and questions. Yes. Um... So yeah, there, there is a huge disjuncture between the title and the abstract and what I'm actually doing. Um, and I think it's because of scope. Um, I've, I think I've bitten off enough for an LLM and I'm a bit wary to tread into PhD territory um, or to, to bite off these topics but not give them the attention that they need. So in terms of jest as a defense, um, quite early on I established or I've uncovered that even though it's listed in every textbook ever as a defense rebutting intention, in reality, it never comes up because it's always dealt with um, under the defamatoriness inquiry. Um, and so I'll probably have to change the title um, to, to something akin to what I'm doing, which is investigating the role of humor in the defamatoriness inquiry. I do want to look at jest as a defense. Um, I am quite interested in how it's been raised um, to rebut Animus in Uriandi. Uh, the standard answer is that dolus eventualis is so wide that you cannot actually escape along that avenue. 
Um, I disagree. I don't think dolus eventualis is the appropriate standard for defamation law. Um, and I think that the defense would fit much better under the wrongfulness inquiry. But to set up a whole defense um, based on public policy reasons, etc., I think I'm going to have to leave for a PhD because it's quite a lot. Um, so yes, the title and the abstract are a bit misleading. I'm probably going to have to tone it down just a little bit. Thank you. You have one minute, and there's a question from Prof Morstadt um, about uh, the shower head in a lot of Zapira's cartoons um, and where, the, where it would fall in the theories um, that you sort of discussed. Yeah, sorry, I just read that now. Um, so yeah, I mean, satire is an interesting beast because um, there is already a defense available for it. So oftentimes what happens with so, for example, the Sapiro cases, um, oftentimes he gets sued and then Zuma drops the case. So we never actually get to read the judgment, but there is a defense available. Um, so the standard answer would be it is defamatory. So even under the humor inquiry, they would probably think it revolves a lot more around superiority theory and say that it is defamatory. But then there's this defense of fair comment, which allows um, you know, satirical cartoonists to get off if it's in the public interest um, and based on truth, etc. Um, but you're quite right. I think the problem I'm facing, and I think, uh, Tabelo, you touched on it, is that any joke can be explained um, by these, th these three theories. And as we see in the Concord, it was split 6-4, and this whole amalgamation of who gets to decide what the nub of the humour is, so there's another case, and I don't have time to go into it, but it was a single judge in the High Court, and he said it was defamatory. And I read the case and I said, but that's ridiculous. This is just the furthest thing from defamatory. Um, and I can pick out the certain words where he, I can see that he felt it was it was based on derision, um, etc., cetera, um, and not the juxtaposition of two absurd ideas. So that is very interesting. Yeah. Thanks so much, Simon. Uh, I have to cede the floor to uh, the remainder of our schedule. Thank you so much, everyone, for an incredible thank session. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for chairing from you. You ran quite a tight ship. Um, I just, before introducing uh, Professor Hugh Corder, um, I just want to acknowledge I thought each speaker would do this as they did it, but they didn't. Uh, just a word to the supervisors. Uh, uh, the first two speakers, Joy and Rovimbo, are supervised by Associate Professor Amanda Barrett. Uh, uh, Simon Thompson is supervised by Dr. Leo Bunzaya. And a big thank you to Dr. Dibello uh, Davani. We now have uh, uh, the moment I'm sure we've all been waiting for our keynote address by um, Emeritus Professor Hugh Corder.